get recorded there. Gotcha. All right. Well, good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. Good to see a good number out. And thank you all that's been attending the services online and in person. We appreciate that. Appreciate the support. Been a great meeting so far. Every every night's been good. I enjoyed the message last night. I was telling a friend about that uh, last night after service. Uh, and uh, hope, hopefully he'll go watch that, that message. If you missed that one, go back and watch it. Uh, it was great. It was a great help to me. And uh, we're focusing on revival. We're going to continue to do that tonight. And tonight's the last night of the scheduled meeting. because I, I, I want us to not forget and just cut off revival thoughts and, and seeking revival tonight. Uh, let it ring on through your life. Keep, keep looking for the Lord to revive you, to renew you on throughout the coming days. Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll do another meeting like this sometime in the future. We've talked about that. And so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. And uh, again, just glad you're able to be here. There's some other folks supposed to be here tonight. Uh, they texted and said they had to stop for some fuel. They'll be on in, so uh, we'll welcome them in when they get here. But Stagger, if you would, stand and lead us the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to get right into our service. We're going to have a song, get into the message tonight, and then see what God has in store for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be together this evening. We thank you for this meeting this week and that which is done for our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies. And we pray that even though the, the meeting itself, as Brother Preston's already said, that even though it will end tonight, let it not end in our hearts and our minds. I pray that each one of us are challenged to be changed, that our hearts would grow closer toward you, to be willing to pay the price and the cost that uh, is required, uh, Father, to have true revival in our hearts and just to, to be able to see what a difference would be made in our communities, our villages, our and man, starting out with our homes, uh, with, uh, with just being revived in our Christian spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit of God to move and direct us in the manner, Lord, that is pleasing unto thee. So, Lord, I pray that you bless Brother Preston tonight with uh, sound words. Pray you give him clarity of thought. Help us, Lord, be willing to hear and apply into our lives, Lord, that we may better serve you. The days we await your return in the air, that we see souls saved, lives changed, and families put back together, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. Amen. Cole, I apologize. I did not turn this microphone on, did I? You didn't tell me that, buddy. That's all right. Uh, all right, brother. If you would, just click the little uh, play button on there and we'll have another song tonight. Thank 
Oh, make sure I've got some volume coming through there. It's working all right. Okay, just want to make sure that's on. If you're watching by recording, I apologize. Those first few seconds did not have sound. That was my fault. If you have your Bibles tonight, let's look in Luke chapter number 16. Luke chapter number 16. When you find your place in Luke 16, if you would stand, I'm going to read a few verses. Good to see you, Andy, Kate, kids. Good to see you there tonight. Luke 16, starting in verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses, and the prophets let them hear them. And he said, Nay, father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Lord, thank you again for letting us be here tonight. Lord, I thank you for those that came. And God, I pray that you'll just uh, use me for a little while as we try to stand for you. We don't have any ability unless you speak through us. And God, I want to get myself out of the way tonight. Uh, this is something you would not allow me to get away from. So I definitely am depending upon you to speak through me, Lord. And I pray that we'll say the words that need to be said and be quiet where we need to be quiet. Uh, God, I ask that you'll open our hearts, our minds, that we keep that mindset of renewal, of revival, as we look at this text tonight, and then we'll get what you want from, for us, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I'll grab a drink here real quick. Get a little water there. This is the first text I ever preached from. I, I look back, and I believe Wendy will probably know better, but I believe it was October 28, 2009. And over the years, the Lord's led me back to this text quite often, and every time showed me something new. Brother Stagner, you know what I mean by that? You, you, the Lord leads you back to a text and it's always something a little new, a little fresh. And no doubt everybody here knows this text well. You've heard it preached on, you've read it, you've studied it, no doubt. And Christ is telling us about a man named Lazarus and a certain rich man who is unnamed. He tells us just a little bit about who they were and then about what they faced after death. And no doubt you're probably thinking, well, I thought we were focused on revival. We're focused on renewal uh, this week. What are you talking about? This is not a revival text. I thought the same thing. 
Um, and, uh, and I tried to do something different and tried to get away, but I, I just want to be sensitive to what God wants tonight. Uh, I said the other night, and I'll say it again tonight, I believe the Lord has prepared what He wants for every service if we be obedient to do what He wants us to do. And so I want to try to do that tonight. Uh, I don't plan to be very long. I know that's dangerous to say. I'm not, uh, it'll be a little longer than Jonah's message of eight words. Uh, but, but I will try not to be long tonight. I, it's a very simple message, but I believe it's something that we all can, can take to heart and get something from. It's something that should move us in our desire to want to be renewed, to be revived. So I want you just to go with me here for a few minutes, and let's look at this text. There was a, the Bible says, a, and this is not going to be a literated outline. I, I want the, the Bible just to speak for itself tonight. I, I, like, I like having points, and I like all that, but I just want the Bible to speak for itself. We'll really just have two main points tonight. But let's look at it tonight. The certain beggar named Lazarus, this man, if you look at his life, what we know about him, he had nothing on earth. He was sick. His body was full of sores. No doubt he was in pain. And he, apparently what you can derive from this text is he was not able to get around very well. He was laid at the gate. Uh, I, my, my thinking there is somebody had to help him be laid at that gate. And the dogs came and licked his sores. He wasn't able to even have the energy to get them away from him. They were licking on those sores. He was outside this rich man's gate desiring to be fed from the crumbs, the leftovers, whatever was left over after everybody else inside the home and ate. He was desiring to be fed from those crumbs from that man's table. And what a hard life that must have been. None of us, I'm sure, have ever faced any, a life like that. We've always had what we need. And what a trying time it must have been for this man Lazarus, day in and day out, to face that kind of life. We'll say more about his death in a moment, but, but notice we don't read of him having a burial. It gives me the thought that he probably didn't have a lot of friends or family that cared for him, that, that, that came to remember him when he died. And then Jesus tells us about a, a man and he calls him the, this certain rich man. He fared sumptuously every day. This man had everything that he could ever want in life. Everything he needed was there. Not only his needs but his desires, he had them there. He was seemingly a healthy man. Had the finest clothing, no doubt a closet full of various garments that he could wear day to day. A table spread with food. He had a home that he could live in, a gated home. And there he was comfortably there in his home. And when he died, he was buried, giving us the thought that there was a funeral ceremony probably for him. He had people there remembering him, mourning him. And this was the lies that Christ describes about these two men. Vastly different men. Different ways of life. But the Lord still intertwined them to show us something, to tell us something. And honestly, as I said before, I believe the Lord in His living Word told us about these men not only just to show us what we're going to talk about tonight, but he's, uh, it, it's one of those scriptures you could preach on for months, the different things you see there. And I think it's going to help us tonight to focus on renewal, on what these, these two men, what we're told of them. There's something to be learned, no doubt. But tonight, as we think upon renewal, I want us to look at these men, what they, not what they had in life. We'll, we may briefly hit it again, but I want to focus on what they had in death. And I think it may spark us towards wanting revival in our life. Again, this is not your typical outline. Brother Stagner said last night, I, I'm not going to preach the way I normally preach. And same thing here tonight. It's going to be a little different, I guess. But as we look at this text for a few moments, I want us to keep in mind this, this thought. Motivations for renewal. Motivations for renewal. And first of all, we'll see this place of comfort should motivate us. And we see Lazarus, he received comfort. If you look in verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember, thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. His life on earth was hard. I've never had to live like he lived on earth. No doubt it was a very horrible life to live. We know his physical conditions. We know his lack of possessions. We know he was there uh, hoping to get some leftovers just to have something to eat. He didn't have much in life, but oh, what he had in death. He may not have had a grand funeral, 
of mourners coming by to remember the life of Lazarus. But we do read that he was carried away into the bosom of Abraham. A simple explanation for that is it's an Old Testament term for heaven. We won't have time to go into all that tonight, but it's the abode of the saints before Christ died and rose again. And when Lazarus died, he didn't have much on earth, but there was a grand welcoming him on into his final home when he died. He left behind this world and entered into a place of comfort. Abraham says a, he's comforted. Lazarus may not have had worldly riches to show in life, but he had put his faith in God at some time in his life. He loved, he served the Lord the best he could in his condition, and now he was in a place of comfort. You and I tonight that are saved have something wonderful to look forward to. I know that our lives do not mimic the life of Lazarus, but we have hard times. We have problems. We are in lockdown now, and, and, and I know that's been hard on some people. It's been discouraging to people. And life may get hard. We may not fit in. I've never fit in anywhere. But thanks be to God, we've got a place of comfort coming soon. We've got a place where we can go and be comforted from this world. That Christ paid the debt of sin so that we could obtain that comfort. We could stop there and say that's motivation enough for renewal in our lives. Knowing that for He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He took on your sin. He died in your place, in my place, so that we could have life, so that we could be comforted. What Christ did for us should be enough, Brother Stagner, that we say, I'm ready for renewal. I'm ready for revival. I'm ready for that fire to be rekindled in my life. There's motivation and comfort for renewal. Lazarus passed from death unto life that day to dwell in his place of comfort. And what we have to gain should motivate us, drive us to want to have that fire in our life to serve God. Looking ahead to what is, is coming should give us a mindset. A mindset of thanksgiving and a desire for revival in our lives. The God of all comfort has something special prepared for us. Let's look, look, quickly look at that place of comfort. John 14, starting in verse 1 says, Let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare, I love this, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. The fact that we have a place prepared for us should set our soul on fire. I, I'm glad that there's mansions there. And I'm not one of them that says I want a little cabin. I want my mansion. But I don't understand mansions in my mind right now. So it, but, but I do understand a, a place. I, I want to have my place there. I'm out of place here. I, I don't fit in here, but I will fit into my place of comfort. And I'm excited that I'm going there. I don't even own a home down here. Brother Stagner, he's trying to buy one, but he doesn't own a home down here. But you know what? I have a place. You have a place up in heaven. A place of comfort waiting on us. That should put a little pep in our step. That should put some praise on our lips. That should want us to seek and to be renewed and have that power of revival in our life because of what we got to look forward to. We're told a little bit about this place, and I'm going to have to mark my spot here in Luke, over in Revelation chapter number 21. I'll flip over there real quickly. I should have had all that marked. And the Revelation chapter 21 tells us a little snippet about this place. Uh, the book here, I'm just going to take a little bit of what, what we're told. There's, there's more to be told on throughout the book. But in Revelation chapter 21... Verse number 1, the Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now I understand this is when everything is all said and done. When that new earth and that new heaven is put into place. But when we get there to that place, it's going to be a place uncorrupted. As a bride adorned for her husband... Now, my wife, that, that day we got married, uh, back almost 19 years ago, she got up and, and fixed herself up 
and she, she fixed her hair just right, her makeup just right. She had on that long, beautiful dress that she had went and labored to pick out. And she did all that. Brother Andy, you know who? Who she did that for? For me. All for me. And I don't know about you other husbands. I'll just admit I was a big baby when she walked down the aisle. Brother Stagner, I started to cry as I looked upon her beauty. And as she come up there and took my hands, Brother Cecil Williams was speaking uh, at our, our, our wedding. And he was, he was going through the wedding ceremony. But I really couldn't tell you much of what he said. You know why? Because I had my eyes on my bride who was adorned for me. Amen. How beautiful she was. And think about this, this place that we're going we're gonna to one day be in, this new heaven, this new earth. It's going to be adorned as a bride for her husband. You know what that means? It's going to be its best. It's fixed and prepared for us. Verse 3 says, And I heard a great voice out of, the he out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. We're going to dwell with the Lord. I'm going to get to be there with my Savior one-on-one -on -one forever. I could stop there and surely we'd be motivated for renewal to serve Him. I said I wasn't going to be very long. I've already been 15 minutes. I've got to hurry. Verse number 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. When all is said and done, when everything is all over, when this new heaven and this new earth is there, we'll walk into this place and He will wipe the tears from our eyes when all the judgments is over, by the way. I believe I'll be crying a whole lot during them judgments. But after all is over, He's going to wipe those tears from my eyes. In that place of comfort, there'll be no more death. You won't have to worry about death anymore. You won't have to mourn over people anymore. There won't be any more sorrow. There won't be any more pain. There'll be no more crying. Can I tell you this? I don't understand all that. I've never lived in a place like that. But I am going to that place and it's going to be full of comfort. All the things that are going to be there and all the things that are not. Verse number 5 real quickly, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This place undefiled, uncorrupted, a place of perfection, a place of comfort. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. We can't imagine this place of comfort. I can picture Lazarus who was once plagued with physical ailments, not knowing comfort at all in his life, probably leaping and praising the Lord still tonight. He's never been hungry again. Can you imagine a man that for one minute was, was wanting some crumbs from a rich man's table and then he died and now he's in a place where he's never going to have to face hunger again. That damaged body that he had was left behind. Knowing that we're going to have comfort to look forward to. Knowing the Lord sent His Son to die for us so we could have that place of comfort should motivate you, should motivate me. It should be enough to bring renewal back to our lives and want to do all we can for Him because of what He did for us. There should be some excitement stirring in our soul, a longing to get closer to Him, a desire to put Him first once again in our lives, to wake up every day with our mind renewed and think, I'm just a little step closer to my place of comfort. That should motivate us to want to do everything we can for Him. Lay up. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there, your heart will, be all, there, your, there will be your heart also. I'm sorry. No greater example than Lazarus who had all his treasures laid up in heaven. What do you mean by that? He had no treasures on earth. We know that. They were all on the other side. His heart wasn't upon things of this world. He wasn't concerned with material things. He couldn't have them. He wasn't concerned about fitting in because he was an old beggar that nobody wanted to be around. His heart was upon his treasure in heaven and now he is present with that treasure in that place of comfort, joy, and rest. David said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. 
That is what we need to do in our lives. That's what I'm talking about tonight is that place of comfort. Because we're saved, we've got that to look forward to. The wonderful fact that we were born again should motivate us. We need not get over our salvation. I think you said something about that maybe last night. It's the greatest gift ever given. A gift that never stops giving, by the way. And if we just get a hold of the fact that we're saved, man, it ought to excite us. It should renew us that we didn't have to die for our sin. I'm preaching on that. Uh, again, we're going to look at it again on Sunday. Psalm 103, He hath not dealt with us after our, our sin or rewarded us according to our iniquities. We've got a place of comfort to look forward to. We didn't have to go to hell. We should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ made sure to leave us an example here in this book of a man named Lazarus that went from death to a place of comfort. And it should motivate us. If knowing that you got heaven to look forward to will not motivate you, then what is going to motivate you? Lazarus is not the only example Christ gives here though. And I've got to hurry. I'm going to be longer than I thought. I apologize. Remember, there was another man, a certain rich man that also died. And a man that also received something in his death, but something much different than Lazarus. He received a place of torments. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And see, hath Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. This man had everything on earth, but nothing in death. He went from comfort in life to a place of torments. Can I say heaven is real, but hell is just as real. And we need to be reminded that that place is real. People make a mockery of it today. They use it as a curse word, not understanding the reality of it. Many say it don't exist. A loving God wouldn't send anyone to a place like that. Can I say, first of all, there, no one, God has never sent anyone to hell. It's their own choice. He doesn't send you there. You make the choice. Christ makes that plain. He says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That day that you're cast into the lake of fire, if you're here lost, you made that choice by not trusting in him. The rich man chose not to put his faith in God. And he passed from death into torments. That place was, by the way, this isn't in the notes, but that place was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't, wasn't intended for man to go, but because of our sin. If you're not saved, that's where you end up. It's eternity. Secondly, hell is real no matter what anybody says. Capital T, truth, is capital T, truth, no matter what I think or you think. Hell's real. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not. And Christ tells us this man, lifting up his eyes, there's an example of truth. He was there, still there. We can stop there and that should motivate you to know hell's real. Those that die lost will find them in themselves in this place. Notice the wording here, being in torments. That tells us again, that's a literal place. He's there right now. It's not a mind state. It's not a spiritual state. Just as this rich man was faring sumptuously every day, now he's literally in the torment of hell. Being tells us that that's where he was, that's where he still is. Experiencing these torments. Notice the torments that are ever present in this place. I'm trying to speed up. First of all, the Bible, or in our text it says, Seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He was well aware of what he missed out on. He could see what he missed. Those that do not believe in Christ will one day be shown the consequences of their choice. What torment that will be to know you could have had heaven, but instead you have hell. I wonder if some may remember you and I and say, Hey, why didn't you tell me about that place? Why didn't you warn me that, that could, I could have had heaven uh, if I'd have just trusted Christ? Why didn't you tell me? But it's too late for them. If if, once they die, I think Brother Stagner made that statement the other night, once they're gone, they're gone. Once they die, people die, it's over. Once the Lord comes back, it's over. And they've missed out on heaven and condemned to the torments of hell. What torment that has to be, just, just the fact of knowing comfort was just in reach. It was available to them. 
but now it's gone. Then see here, let me see, I should have marked what verse this is in here so you can. It says, he, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Verse 24. Jesus said in Matthew 13, So shall it be at the end of the world that angels come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of crying. Look, look back at verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Crying out to Abraham. Why? Because he was in torment and he wanted some help. That gnashing of teeth, grinding their teeth, biting down because of the overwhelming pain they're going through. Tears will be wiped away in heaven, but in hell the cries never end. Oh, the screaming and crying that will take place there. Think with me for just a moment. Crying is an unpleasant thing. Think about the times that you've had to scream and raise your voice. Brother Stagner, the times that you preached with all the power you could and you, with your voice just went out and it hurt. It was sore, the throat dry, and it hurts sometimes for days, and finally you get that feeling back, and it feels better. This place of torment, these cries are ringing out constantly, and I know this seems minimal, but those cries, can you imagine their throat from screaming and crying? No doubt that causes even more pain. The volumes of cries of countless people. Have you ever thought about hell as a place you'll never find anything quiet? You'll never be able to go off and gather your thoughts because there's going to be crying there, constant. Can you imagine the mental torment from that? God is present in heaven, but not there in hell. As we look on where the place of comfort where Lazarus dwells with the Lord, there's, there's no need to pray anymore in heaven. Again, because God's present there. You've got a perfect dwelling place, you can just go up and talk with the Lord. We never read of Lazarus saying anything. He's not crying out. He's in a place of comfort. He's enjoying himself. He's no doubt showing thanksgiving for the comfort that's bestowed upon him. But in hell, there's some praying going on. There's some crying out and praying that's came much too late. Praying without any effect. We see this rich man's praying for a, a drop of water, praying for mercy. But this place of torments, there is no water, there is no mercy. The rich man mentions the flame. He says, for I am tormented in this flame. Those that want to say hell's not real, there is no fire there. This man's there and he's telling us about a flame. It's real. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their, play, their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. A burning fire that never goes out. The Bible, uh, Jesus tells us in the fire is not quenched, never satisfied. The flames of hell are eternally burning, tormenting those that are there. Have you ever been burned? I've been burned a few times, not severely, but bad enough that it, it hurt. And man, the pain went on for days, it seemed like. But after a little while, that, that, that burn healed. And everything went back to normal and the pain was gone. But in hell, can you imagine the flames that are never quenched, the fire that's never quenched, that constantly burns? There's never any relief. I imagine it gets more intense day after day. And notice the people that are in this place. That list of wicked people. The murderers, the whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. But also the fearful and unbelieving. All these wicked people and some good moral people are dwelling among them. People that just would not believe the truth. For some that didn't get to hear the truth because you and I failed them because we were not renewed enough to go out and have a desire to tell them about the truth. Hell's no respecter of a person. doesn't matter who they are. If they're lost and they go there, they're going to be in torment. Look here at verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, 
thou art tormented. According to the words of the Lord here, this place of torment is a place where people will retain their mental capacity of remembrance. Oh, the torment that must bring. We talk about the physical torment, but the mental torment. Remembering the good times they had on earth and knowing they'll never be again. Memories of walking past maybe Saren Chapel Baptist Church or Horde Baptist Church and hearing the, the singing and wondering what was going on there. Memories of those leaflets that got passed through the door and they threw in the rubbish bin. Memories of those that did witness to them. Memories bringing to mind what? If I'd have just listened. Man, that brother Stagner over at Saren Chapel, he was right. Why didn't I listen? And no doubt maybe some others. Memories of seeing me and seeing you go to church every Sunday. Maybe your neighbors seeing you get in your car and take off down to the church but never saying a word about the Lord to them. Never sharing the gospel. Never warning them of this place that they were headed to. And they say, why? Why didn't you warn me? It's a place of torments. Notice in verse 26, And beside all this, betwixt us, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence, thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. This is, there, there's torment in eternal separation. Separation, again, from anything good. Separation from all love. Separation from all grace. From all mercy. Just as heaven is eternal, Brother Andy, so is hell is eternal. And there's no way out. For those that go into this place, no more chances. It's all a final dwelling place. And what a place that place of torments must be. I could never give you a full understanding of what it's truly like. I'll just give you a little, little overview. We don't have time to go in depth with everything. But I will tell you it's beyond my comprehension how tormentful hell is. And it's real. I want you to get that tonight. It is real. The comfort that you and I should gain should motivate us to search out revival for our lives. But knowing that this place of torments exists should motivate us just the same. Knowing that just a few feet from us, we were standing out there just a moment ago when some, some young people walked by. And I wonder, have they ever heard the gospel? Knowing that just down the street from us, people that we see daily are going to this place of torments. They're headed there, on their way there. I've heard everyone here in this building mention friends that they have that are lost, family that are lost. And can I tell you tonight, if they do not hear the truth, they do not get born again, they're going to go to this place. They're going to be in this place of torments. I don't like saying that. But until we get a hold of that truth, until we get that into our hearts, we're never going to get motivated. We're never going to get revived to want to go and, and have a burden to see people saved. I'm not trying to pull at your emotions. I am not trying to do that tonight. I'm just wanting you to see this is real. And we need to be revived because people count on us. But I will say it does... It, it should pull at your emotions a little bit. It bothers me. It scares me. I'm thinking of people now that I know they're going to go to this place of torments and it bothers me. And that bothersome spirit shouldn't be enough to revive me. To go forward and do what we can. To do the job He left us here to do. People depend upon us and we need to let the reality of the comfort excite us, revive us, but also the reality of that place of torments grab hold of us and motivate us. Renew our spirit, renew our desires, renew our drive. Lastly, I want you to see one more motivating factor in this passage. Verse number 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come to the, into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. 
And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. There's this rich man in hell, and he's pleading with Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to testify to his brothers that are lost. Oh, the torment he felt, knowing where he was. But notice also his mind went to those people that were still living that he loved, and he couldn't stand the fact that they were going to end up in that same place. He had a burden within him. He wanted to prevent others from having to come and dwell in this place of torment. He didn't want anybody else there with him. He had brothers that he loved that he knew were going to end up here and he wanted to do anything he could to stop that from happening. You see, I want us to get a hold of that reality of heaven and that reality of hell for sure. But also look at this reality of this man that is still in hell today. and He 100% knows the reality of the torment. And that reality has burdened him so for those that he loved, but he can't do anything about it. What torment that must be for him. That he's there, knowing the pain, knowing people he cares about are going to come there and be with him in that place of torments. And I know he can't warn them. Abraham tells him, says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What was he saying? They have the word of God to put their faith in. And can I tell you, the same rings true today. We not only have Moses and the prophets, Brother Steiner, but we have a completed 66 books of God's inspired word. This man could not go and share the word with his brothers. Lazarus couldn't go back to him. And oh, how he longed to get the word of God to them, but he couldn't. The fact that a man in hell, and by the way, I believe everyone in hell, I think this is just an example of, of one man, but there's, there's more there, and no doubt they all share the same thoughts. I want to get back and warn others. But they can't. And that should motivate you. That should motivate you. That should motivate me. That should get a fire and a burden burning in our souls to know that a lost man in hell has a desire to see people saved. That should humble us on our faces and beg God to renew a, a right spirit within us, to renew our minds, to renew our hearts, to give us revival to want to go and share the gospel with lost souls. To beg God to give us one more opportunity. Oh, the joy of being saved. i got to close tonight. Knowing that we have a place of comfort. I wish I could have spent more time there. but He gives us more about where the rich man is. Knowing that we got that comfort awaiting us should excite us, revive our soul. I've got a dad there now. And I think about him every day. And it excites me that one day I'm going to that place of comfort and I'll be there where my dad's at. The love that Christ has for me, that he took on my sin to save me. The place that he has prepared for me. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank God if you're the whosoever that does not have to perish and has everlasting life. That's enough to set a fire in our soul and it should motivate us. I'm preaching on these, this text on Sunday again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. We, let us not forget the joy of salvation, the benefits of salvation. Remember who He is, what He's done, and where we're going. And that should ring out revival in our life. And so should that place of torment. Real people go to a real hell every day, every second. And there is the whosoever that believed on Him that does not have to perish. But I want to share with you real quickly, there is another whosoever. Revelation 20, 15, And whosoever was not found, written in the book of life, was cast in the lake of fire. People next door, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, parents, good people, bad people, when death comes, time is no more. That place of torments will be their home. And if you're saved today, that reality of hell should motivate us to want revival. The Word of God is here to lead people to Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It is available. But what are we that are left here to make it known? What are we doing with it? How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to have revival in their life to go tell them. And that's me and you. That's our responsibility. Everyone has an eternal dwelling place. Man, that place of comfort. How exciting. And then there's that place of torment. That should be responsibility enough to motivate us to make changes in our life. I think I've said this before, but there's a, there's a preacher I heard preaching uh, right before I came over here, and he said, it's time we make the main thing the main thing again. If we get the main thing in our life, then we can get revived. Does knowing you got that place of comfort tonight motivates you. I want to be revived and labor for the Lord, and showing Him thanksgiving for what He's done for me. Do you want to do that? Put your mind upon heaven and just keep walking that way. Revive, serving Him. But also that place of torment has got to be somewhere in our mind, knowing it's real. And give us a renewed burden, a renewed fire. Revival is for us that are saved. But if we truly get it, and it's been said every night I think, if we get a hold of it, it will have a great effect on others, on people all around us. What would happen Brother Stagner, I believe, mentioned this if one of us got revived. But what would happen if we really get motivated tonight and we get a hold of revival within us? I don't know how many people are here, 15, 20 people. Man, what if revival took place in every one of our lives? Wells would be turned upside down if we got a hold of it. We could have an effect on people. Lord, I feel like that's where I need to quit. I thank you tonight for your word, for the examples you give us. And God, I pray that we'll take it to heart. I know this was a different message for revival, but it's what you wanted. I just wanted to be sensitive, and I pray that we'll let it sink in. The reality of that place of comfort and that reality of that place of torments, we can be motivated to want revival in our lives. Thank you for this meeting. Thank you for all those that are here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to do this before we close off of the... Um, off of the video, off the live stream. Brother Stagner, if you want to come up and say a few words, uh, he, this was his idea. The Lord put upon his heart to do, and I want him to take some time if he wants to say a few words, and then we'll, uh, we'll dismiss after that.
be in your, your, your respective churches on Sunday. Let's take this thing. Let's get that fire burning. And uh, let's just get excited about being saved. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, we'll be dismissed in prayer. And Cole, you can cut off the, uh, the recording. And then I know Brother Stagner will cut off his live stream after we dismiss. Lord, thank you again for letting us be here tonight. Uh, thank you for those that came. I thank you for the good meeting every night. And I pray that something that was said tonight will be a help to someone. Lord, it's helped me all throughout the week. And God, I pray that we will remember and uh, let revival take place in our lives. If we want it, all we got to do is go after it, seek it. And that it not end tonight, but that we get a fire rekindled and we begin to see a difference made in our communities. Lord, I pray you bless Brother Stagger and his family as they uh, work there in Aberamon. And I pray that you will uh, bless each one as they go home tonight, that you'll watch over and protect their, their journey back. And be with our family and help us, help us here at the Horror Baptist Chapel that we can reach this community. And God, that you'll do a mighty work here. In Jesus' name, amen.